this uh, this is a very very uh, exciting panel and, uh, and and one that is um, sort of uh, you know at the prestigious I think uh, at sort of the height of this conference. Um, uh, it's on the topic obviously of assessing performance in no feedback environment. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, a lot of things uh, from sort of uh, an accountability gap with sort of having our beneficiaries at, at, at the end of the A chain uh, having little power and little voice to problems of feedback culture in organizations in which we work and uh, metrics being very hard to define in, in this field to, um, uh, you know, working in very complex type change environment with a lot of feedback loops, some being short term some being uh, much longer term, uh, and finally obviously working with uh, many different stakeholders, all of them wanting uh, sort of some, some, some piece of the attribution pie and, uh, um, and, and sort of wanting their input to be heard. And so uh, our, our panelists, which I'm not gonna introduce at length, are, are sort of uh, experts in their, in their respective fields. Uh, so we have um, uh, uh, Gary uh, Tonneson, sorry, <laughs> from the Tennyson, from the Rockefeller Found Foundation, uh, Vernon Lobo from Mosaic Ventures, and then uh, John Ecklinger from Global Giving. Um, all have extensive experience in, in, uh, in this topic and will provide a different perspective. Um, in terms of the structure of the panel, um, so we'll each give them about sort of 10 minutes, so half of, half of the time to, to give a, a small expose uh, about uh, their perspectives on, the, on this topic. And then, uh, and then I'll probably um, sort of ask a couple of questions, which I think will be of relevance to this audience, and then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, I'll probably take something like three at a time, and I'm happy to translate French uh, questions from francophones if that's easier for you, uh, because it's a fairly complex topic. So uh, without any further ado, um, yeah. Thanks, Louis. Um, I may not uh, comment in as much detail about the methodologies uh, as, uh, as Louis might like. Uh, uh, I'm a crop scientist, I'm not a, uh, an m and &E specialist. What I'm gonna try to do is, is indicate some of the frustrations that uh, at least I have had and I think others have had uh, over the years with trying to assess agricultural programs uh, and the success of agricultural uh, projects. Um, and what I'll First off is indicate some of the methodologies that the Rockefeller Foundation uses, but then get into what frustrates me, and that is that most of these evaluations don't go beyond the project. And in my opinion, they need to go beyond the project in both scale, in looking outside the project, and beyond the project in time, uh, looking to see uh, not so much how sustainable it is, but rather it leads, rather it leads to the next step in the development process. So at the Rockefeller Foundation, we have a number of standard techniques for doing monitoring and evaluation. Uh, we are a grant-making organization, so we ask our grantees uh, to have milestones, uh, deliverables we expect from them, and we expect them all to have their own m and &E system so that they can, uh, first of all, learn uh, whether they're succeeding or not, but also uh, feed that back into us. And then at the foundation uh, itself, for our initiatives, we call them now, not programs, uh, we have a standard uh, results-based management framework with outputs, outcomes, uh, indicators, uh, etc. Uh, since we are a grant-making organization and we are frustrated with some uh, of this uh, uh, M&E work, uh, we also try to advance the field. Uh, and so we do award grants to develop uh, new uh, methods of M&E and to test those methods. And in fact, uh, one of our grants is to John's organization, uh, Global Giving, and I think he'll report on uh, the results of, uh, of one of those grants. And then what I really want to talk about is this, this problem of uh, uh, evaluating projects or uh, determining the success of a project uh, and looking at the, both the scale and the time dimensions. Okay, first with regard to, to scale. Um, I've been with the foundation many years, led the agricultural program for the last uh, decade or more, and uh, we fund a lot of agricultural development projects 
uh, in Africa. Uh, by the nature of agriculture, and certainly by the nature of Africa, that's a low feedback uh, and environment. And, and many times, what, sh what we get back is an assessment of the project. And the project is declared a success. And so let me give you an example. Um, we, in, in the 1990s, put about $20 million into research and demonstration projects trying to develop a way of improving soil fertility in Africa without using fertilizer. Not because we have any philosophical objection to fertilizer, uh, but because most of the African farmers we were dealing with didn't have access to fertilizer, or if there was fertilizer nearby, they couldn't afford it. So they basically weren't, uh, weren't able to use fertilizer, uh, and so uh, we funded a lot of research, and I said a demonstration. So this was uh, developing cover crops like macuna, agroforestry systems, a variety of mixed cropping systems. And many of those, uh, the, the research led to a technology that works. And in many cases, that technology was taken out to test villages, and in those test villages, the farmers would adopt that technology, and even at the village level, the technology would work, and our grantees would go through their internal M&E process and, and declare success. Uh, and in fact, you can even sometimes see books like 21 Successful Ag Development Projects. And uh, you know, 10 of those 20 will be ones we funded, uh, but they didn't go beyond the project. If you went to the village next door, who were obviously observing what was going on in the test village, those farmers weren't adopting that technology. And many times, uh, once the project team left, even the the demonstration product, uh, village uh, would no longer continue to use the, the technology unless there were some kind of circum special circumstances, you know, a, a special market uh, created that, that uh, provided incentives for using that technology, organic uh, being the principal one. Uh, these technologies did not use fertilizer, therefore they were organic, and in some cases uh, the, the farmers were able to tap into a specialty market. But in most cases, uh, the technology did not spread. It was a successful project, but it did not lead to successful agricultural development. So we need ways of getting feedback beyond the project. And in fact, we, we did fund some work to talk to the farmers next door or in the next villages. Uh, these are mostly women farmers, uh, very limited labor supply, uh, and all of these techniques required additional labor. And, uh, you know, these women are not just farming, they're taking care of the kids, they're fetching water, they're cooking, uh, they're uh, getting firewood. They have umpteen dozen different demands on their time. And growing macuna as a, as a cover cop just simply didn't compete, uh, even though they realized the potential uh, value of doing that. Uh, I put this slide up because it's an example of, of one that is going to scale. These are the Narika rices, the new rices for Africa. Uh, they were developed for West Africa. Uh, and this particular village, or this particular field, happens to be in northern Uganda. Uh, and we were <laughs> very surprised, uh, since we had helped to develop the Narika rices, uh, uh, to be traveling through nor northern Uganda. Uh, and find in, in East Africa and finding the Narika rices uh, spreading uh, spontaneously through through that region. So you need to look beyond the project uh, to see real success. And I think these Narika rices will be a, a real uh, successful agricultural development technology. Okay, let's talk a little bit about time. Um, agricultural development takes time. Uh, so you're not going to accomplish it in three years or five years, in part because it needs to go through stages, particularly when you're starting off uh, with a majority of your farmers who are in what the economists refer to as poverty traps. Uh, they're, in, in many cases, they're not even producing enough to feed the family, let alone producing enough to generate any income so that they can uh, buy the inputs that they need to produce more. So they're trapped in a situation where 
uh, the best they're doing is feeding the family and not really generating any income. So at that level, you really do need to uh, come in with some kind of a public sector investment. Uh, you, need, you need an intervention of some type, uh, technology, but you also need to subsidize that uh, to get that group out of, uh, out of that poverty trap and producing uh, a surplus. And once that surplus is produced, you then need some form of uh, marketing system, financial system, that allows that surplus to be turned into, into profits. And that's often not there. Uh, and uh, you, you, you need to transition from what was kind of a giveaway program to now into a more market-oriented uh, activity. And then finally, uh, the next stage is to have significant numbers of those small-scale farmers move into small-scale commercial uh, production. And you're talking about a 15 to 20 year process here. Uh, at that stage, uh, they're adding value to their products, they're converting their grain into feed, uh, for example. Crazy thing, Africa imports feed. How silly is that when they, they really can uh, produce significant amounts of, uh, of grain? Or they can convert part of their farm to cash crops because they're now getting higher yields of the staple food crops uh, on the other portion of the farm. Uh, they can begin generating off-farm income, which has a significant stabilizing effect for the whole uh, family and the farm itself. Uh, regional trade, global trade. Uh, and the family can begin to invest in health and education uh, for, the, for the kids. Uh, and when you educate kids, uh, a significant number of them are going to move out of agriculture. And that's actually a good thing. In a, in a country like uh, Malawi, where 90% of the people are dependent upon small-scale agriculture, that's not, a, that's not a, a, a situation in which you can have economic development because if everybody's producing a surplus, who do you sell it to? And uh, so if you have a project that declares success because it moves people out of those poverty traps and uh, into a situation where they're now able to feed the family, and we often see projects that come back in and say, our project, our program was successful because the people are now, uh, are now better fed. It really isn't a successful agricultural development uh, project, and they may well be back in the same situation they were previously, unless you are able to transition into that next stage of development. And so you, your monitoring system needs to look beyond that project and say, did you facilitate that transition? Uh, just finish up with a, an example. Uh, this probably looks a little bit complicated. It's from Glenn Denning. And what it does is it shows the impact of various programs uh, to improve agricultural production in Malawi by providing technology, usually better seeds and fertilizer, and subsidizing that in one form or another. So it goes all the way back uh, to when President Banda, uh, President for Life in Malawi, was uh, uh, providing uh, most of the people with, uh, with the inputs, um, mainly because he wanted cheap labor for his tobacco farms or for the, uh, the big tobacco farms in the country. But still, uh, people were uh, pretty well fed. So just to put this in, in context, the green line is the maize requirement in Malawi, uh, continually increasing because the population of Malawi is increasing very rapidly. And then the red line is maize production. So uh, after President Banda's era, uh, significant deficits because those subsidy programs were, uh, were taken away. And then over time, a number of new programs coming into place as big deficits occurred and the country went into disaster situations. So the drought recovery program, uh, something called Starter Pack, we were deeply involved in designing Starter Pack uh, and, and helping to implement it. It was just basically a small pack of seed and fertilizer given to every farmer in Malawi. It was supposed to be a demonstration so that the farmers would see the value of seed and fertilizer and the, the, and the project lasted for, for three years. So at the end of the three years, they'd go and buy it. Well, you can see what happened at the end of the, 
uh, at the end of the three years. Uh, and I actually went to our board in year two and showed our board what a big success this project was uh, because we didn't look beyond uh, that particular project. All the farmers produced a, produced a surplus, absolute price collapse. Uh, the, the price of maize uh, dropped considerably lower, uh, not, not surprisingly, than it was <laughs> uh, in, the years, uh, in the years previously. Uh, and uh, the donors uh, became unhappy. But even if the donors, uh, or even if the, if the inputs were there, the farmers wouldn't have bought it because the farmers had seen that the price that they were going to get for that surplus wasn't worth the, the extra effort. We're now in a situation, many of you know, the president of Malawi has again put in place a, a subsidized program. The yields have gone up again. Uh, currently, Malawi is, is fortunate, is, is maybe the wrong term, uh, but they are fortunate that Zimbabwe is such a disaster. Because normally, Zimbabwe would be a huge competitor with regard to maize production in southern Africa. Uh, Zimbabwe is a, is a great agricultural country and traditionally was a big exporter. Uh, so they competed with Malawi whenever Malawi had a surplus. Now, because of the, the government situation in, in Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe is actually a market for uh, Malawi's surplus production and this scheme is, is working. But it, it's, it's not going to be sustainable unless Malawi can move into that last stage of the graph that I showed you, into commercialization, where they're not just trying to sell raw maize, uh, but rather are converting that maize into chickens, for example, uh, and, and adding value. Uh, to that. They import chickens from Brazil, for crying out loud. They, you know, that the, there's opportunities there for uh, that commercialization process. Uh, and we, we need to make sure that we, um, we don't declare success uh, too early uh, in, in these types of, of programs. So I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. So my name is uh, Vernon Lobo. Give you a little bit of a background on me. Um, did an engineering degree and an MBA, and then I worked at uh, McKinsey and Consulting for a while, which is actually how I got originally introduced to EWB, because for those of you who don't know, that's where Parker used to work. Um, and then uh, for the last 15 or so years, I've been involved with uh, uh, investing, primarily in venture capital with uh, traditionally early stage companies. And, um, you know, with that background, you know, you may be asking yourself, what am I doing here? And trust me, I'm asking myself the same question. And, uh, you know, Parker and George and Louie had said to me, hey, can you, you know, come and do this talk? And I looked at the list of speakers and I said, wow, there's some like, pretty serious, experienced, knowledgeable people here. Like, I don't know anything about this stuff. And they're like, yeah, we know that, but everyone else we asked wouldn't do it, so can you please do it? <laughs> so with that caveat, let me be honest, I don't know that much about international development. I love what EWB is doing. I've tried to learn from uh, George and Parker and others. Uh, but I do know a little bit about uh, investing in early stage companies, and given the panel is about, you know, how do you measure performance in a low feedback environment, I thought I'd maybe think about some of the principles that we use in the venture capital industry and I'll try to make a linkage to what might be applicable to the uh, development world, but don't laugh at me if they're completely off, but hopefully this is something to uh, give you guys a little bit to think about in terms of principles. So just as a, uh, a background, venture capital is, is typically uh, making equity investments in either startup businesses or very early stage companies with an objective of trying to grow those businesses, make them become successful, and hopefully generate a return, a financial return, uh, for the investors. Um, and that, can, that success can come through uh, different uh, mechanisms, but typically a sale of the business or an IPO or even just selling the equity that you invested in at the beginning. Um, now, this is typically a very high risk, high reward uh, proposition. As, as I'm sure most of you know, most businesses fail. And uh, venture capitalists spend a lot of time trying to figure out 
how to mitigate risk or how to uh, um, uh, avoid uh, problems or at least try to stack the odds in their favor of success. Um, the other aspect about the venture capital model is that if there's a winner in your portfolio, the winners can be huge winners. Uh, you know, Google is an example, Apple, eBay, Amazon, those are all venture-backed companies that if you become successful with one of these businesses, they can cover a lot of losers. You can make 10 times, 100 times your money, so you could have a whole bunch of losers and the, and the winner financially will have covered all your losers. The 20-60-20 sort of it's a rule of thumb, often uh, VCs will have a model whereby out of 10 companies they invest in, two will fail, six will kind of break even, and if you're lucky, two of them will become big successes and as I said earlier, cover, uh, cover the failures. And This is an important point because it relates to some of the things VCs do to manage this type of probability which is typically stacked against you. The other thing that might have some similarities to the development uh, uh, process is th there's a lot of unknowns at the beginning. Um, you know, typically early stage investing and VC investing is in kind of the next new hot thing. So by definition, no one will have a ton of experience in it. And so you don't know much about the business, you don't know much about the industry. Typically as the investor, you're meeting an entrepreneur for the first time, you don't really know that person and you're getting to know them. And so you spend a lot of time up front ensuring that you get to know each other, that you trust one another, that you understand the business and you have a common understanding of what the business is trying to achieve. So I thought I'd just describe to you three of the principles, and there's lots more complexity than this, but I tried to distill it into three kind of concepts that we use in the venture capital industry to help us manage risk and also measure progress when we don't have the financial returns, because typically in the early stages of a business, they're not profitable. They're doing other things and we have to use proxies for progress and, and movement towards the success that, that everyone's ultimately looking for. The first is to have a portfolio. So you can't really just pick one or two companies and expect, given what I described earlier in terms of uh, the, the likelihood of success, to have, to, have, to have been lucky enough to pick the winner. Because there's many, many things that are beyond your control which can influence the success or failure of a business. And I suspect the same might be true in the development field. However, if you have enough companies in your portfolio, your odds of having roughly that probability of success improves. And so typically, most venture capital firms will have 10, 20, 15, it could be a, a larger number depending on the size of the fund, companies in the portfolio to ensure that they're gonna get closer to that say that 20% probability of success and hopefully the model in aggregate works. The other thing that's uh, a very important concept for uh, the venture industry is to stage capital. So in other words, you won't invest all the money that a company needs right up front to see them through to the ultimate success that they're trying to achieve. You usually try to break the business or the business plan down into stages or key milestones or key risks that you want to see mitigated uh, within a certain amount of capital before investing more capital. So almost every venture firm goes through these stages where they raise successive rounds of capital and in fact it's pretty typically known in the, um, in the venture industry and in the entrepreneurial industry they'll, they'll letter the rounds, it'll be an A round, a B round, a C round. It gives you a sense of how advanced the company is. And there's a number of reasons for that, I'll get into that shortly. And the other you know, very important thing is that we get a very, or we try anyway, to get a very clear alignment of interest between the investor and the entrepreneur, both in terms of what the business is trying to achieve, but also in terms of the outcomes financially for, for the party. So we want to make sure if things go well, each party gets their fair share of the success, and if things go badly, each party gets their fair share of the pain, if you will. And there's a lot of time spent in structuring deals, but also, as I said early, uh, earlier, making sure you get to know one another and that you trust one another and that you can work through things when they inevitably uh, go badly or go differently than what was expected up front. So just to give you a bit of an example, I mean, these are not uh, scientific numbers or anything. They're just illustrative to give you a sense of how uh, probabilities can work against you, but also how we might use various stages to, to um, fund a business or to put together a, a structure for funding. So if you 
you know, if we have a software company, somebody comes in to meet with us and says, we got this great idea to build this amazing software, and um, you know, it's going to be the next Google. We try to break it down into what are the different things that you need to do to accomplish this, this success, and where are the areas of risk, and what are the milestones we might be able to measure non-financial success against. So I've just given some examples. The first thing you might need to do is just build the software and a demo to prove that it works. And there's some engineering, some software, some coding associated with that. Maybe it's a very complex piece of code and it involves all kinds of stuff that uh, is unconventional. And so you'll say, well, okay, one of the things we need to do is get a demo of the software and that's going to cost X dollars. And maybe there's a 70% probability of that being a successful demo. And once you've got a demo of the software and you've kind of coded it up and it's now ready to uh, go into a customer, you've got to find your first customer and see if they'll deploy it and see if it works. It's got to integrate into other things that they're doing in their system. It's got to have a you know, friendly user interface. The customer's got to like it. There's a bunch of things associated with that. Maybe that has a 70% probability of success. Then you've got to make sure that there's a value proposition to the customer. In other words, that they're getting some benefit from it and hopefully the benefit they're getting from it exceeds what it would cost for them to buy it and install it and maintain it. And so does it have a value proposition for the customer? That's another kind of milestone or, or risk. Again, let's say there's a 70% probability of that. Now you've got to see if you can get a broader set of customers to adopt it. Maybe you've got one customer, now you've got to find a way to sell it to multiple customers, and you've got to make sure that the cost of selling it to those customers um, doesn't exceed the value that you uh, generate from selling to them. Because um, sometimes sales costs can be very, very high and, and uh, make a company not profitable. So that's another risk. Can you, can you get adoption? Can you get scale in the business? And then finally, can you do that profitably? Because as the business grows, are your costs going to grow faster or are your costs going to stay relatively fixed? So just to give you a sense, these are some of the stages or milestones or risks that you might lay out when looking at a new software business. And let's just assume, because these are all contingent probabilities, that each of them has a 70% probability of success. Well, when you multiply it all out and you go through it, you say, well, at the end of it, it's roughly 16.8 or 17% probability that you're going to get through all those gates for all those stages. And so that's a little bit why there's a lot of risk to uh, a startup business, but it's also uh, part of how we think about staging capital. And let's take this example against some of these milestones. So what we'll do is we'll sit down with the entrepreneur at the beginning. Those may be the milestones, there may be other ones, and it's very different by business and by industry. But we'll sit down and try to think through what those risks are and what those stages are and how much capital is required to accomplish each stage. And we try, at least we try to align the capital structuring with, with those risks and milestones so that we can ensure that as the business progresses it can continue to get funded. And we try to establish that understanding right up front so that everyone's on the same page and we know collectively what we're trying to achieve and then in terms of uh, feedback and performance evaluation everyone knows what the objectives are and whether or not they're being achieved or not for the investor and you know in this in your case maybe for donors if things are not going well or they've gone disastrously or there's some fundamental assumptions that we made at the beginning of the business that have proven to be completely wrong then we can mitigate our losses if things are, have gone completely off the rails. And uh, conversely, if something was wrong in the assumptions and as a result the milestones haven't been achieved, but there's still a really good business idea there and there's still other ways to accomplish what we set out to accomplish, then we can reevaluate that on an interim basis and kind of re-plan or re-vector the way the business is going to unfold. And so that gives us sort of checkpoints with the entrepreneur to ensure that we're still moving into a direction that'll give everyone the success they're looking for. And then finally, just we spend a lot of time, as I said, really getting to know one another, the investor and the entrepreneur, and then ensuring the deal is structured in a way that it aligns our interests. And you know, there's all kinds of complexity associated with how deals are done. There's different classes of shares, there's certain rights associated with shares, it could be dividends, there could be veto power um, associated with certain actions, there's board seats and board approvals, there's compensation, there's a, a hundred different things that are worked into these deals, but the real idea is to make sure that people's interests are aligned and no one's taking advantage of one another and no one's you know, being taken advantage of by the other. The other thing for, for um, investors is we really look for entrepreneurs who are you know, very passionate 
and knowledgeable about the business because building a business is very tough, as I'm sure uh, some of the development work you guys do is, and you have to have the commitment and the passion to achieving your success to kind of get through some of those tough times. And I think I've already made this last point, which is upfront time is, is quite important to ensure we have a mutual understanding. So this is now where I'll go out on a limb and try to think about some uh, applicability to what you guys do and risk making a fool of myself. But the, the concept of a portfolio, I would think, might have some relevance to what you guys are doing as opposed to doing one-off uh, development programs with donors, perhaps having multiple projects, perhaps around themes, perhaps around geography, to give some diversity, recognizing that not everything is going to be successful. Um, the concept of stage capital. I don't know if that, uh, that applies to some of the things you guys do and whether or not you can disaggregate development programs into interim milestones or interim checkpoints that will allow donors and agencies and beneficiaries to kind of check and see whether or not things are going in the direction that they were supposed to have been going based on what was uh, originally established up front. And obviously this would require all the parties in the chain to get together and ensure they're on the same page which really speaks to the last point. And I know this is something that I think is very challenging for you guys, and I know EWB works hard at this, and I've learned from, from Parker and George and Louie and others that this is actually a bit of a challenge. Donors have a certain agenda. You know, the, the agencies and the development organizations are trying to implement them, and the beneficiaries are sort of caught at the end, and at least when I've heard this described to me, it's a, obviously a very difficult task that you guys face. But one that I would, I guess, encourage to try to think through how you can get some alignment through that chain and ensure that donors are establishing goals that are consistent with what is going to be beneficial for the ultimate user as opposed to what their own agenda might be in terms of having some impact. And then the organizations in between implementing these are there to sort of ensure that things are on track and they're providing feedback to the donors that allow them to either make course corrections or adjustments as things go along. Um, so that's it. That's uh, what I thought I would share with you, and I'll be happy to take questions afterwards. Thanks. John Hecklinger. I'm with uh, the Global Giving Foundation. We're a DC-based uh, organization that operates a marketplace for uh, development. Uh, through Global Giving, uh, you can support uh, any of a thousand or so specific projects run by a thousand or so organizations uh, working in over a hundred countries. Uh, thanks, Lloyd. Thanks for uh, thanks to EWB for inviting me here. Uh, very impressed with the the topics and the tone of the, and the, the content of the conversations I've had so far and looking forward to the rest of the conference. So this is essentially a story about um, increasing feedback and making it actionable. Um, in development, you know, it, it, it's not like selling cola. Um, and unfortunately, it's not as easy as looking at which of your uh, portfolio investments are ultimately going to become profitable. The situation is is a lot more complex than that, and success is, is hard hard to measure. Um, at Global Giving, you know, we've had some measure of success. We're operating a website that's generated you know, over $36 million in flow to specific initiatives in over 100 countries. Uh, over 140,000 individuals have given through Global Giving uh, with a median donation of $50. Um, we are, uh, our model is to sustain ourselves by retaining a small percentage of the donations that flow through the platform and to earn revenue by working with uh, companies uh, to help them implement international giving programs. So we're at 75% or so cost recovery at this point, which is up from 30% a couple of years ago. So by many measures, we are having success as a marketplace. Um, we're solving two problems. For innovators around the world, we're giving them a chance to have their ideas heard. We're giving them a chance to have their ideas funded and recognized. And for donors, we're solving a problem of, well, I give my 100 bucks, what, what happened to it? So we've been able to solve those two problems. For the donors, when you give your $100, your 
you get feedback that yes, there's somebody on the other end who is using that money for what you designated it to be used for. And for the innovators around the world, we're saying yes, come to Global Giving, prove that you're qualified, and your idea can have a shot. That doesn't sound like maybe a big deal, but that is huge uh, because having this lowering that barrier to entry for innovative ideas around the world is something that Global Giving is in a position to do because our risk. Is, is minimal. We don't have an endowment. We don't give away millions of dollars. We facilitate giving to these organizations. So we're, we're in a position to be able to allow more failure and to be more risk tolerant than many other organizations would be. So it's, that's cool, but uh, does it all add up to anything? So this is a great marketplace we've built. And we, we could stop there. We could say, you know what? We're nearing cost recovery. We're funding lots of great organizations around the world. We can measure outputs. We can measure flows. Um, but are we really delivering on our mission, which is helping underdog and innovative organizations around the world get from point A to point B? Um, are we somehow with our marketplace increasing the accountability and transparency of organizations to their communities and to their donors? Are we helping organizations by using advanced tools like Global Giving learn to be more effective, not just on fundraising, but in doing their work? Um, so why the rat? Uh, this, is, this is our Google. This is, uh, when we look at this portfolio of a thousand plus organizations around the world, this is our Google. This is uh, Hero Rats. Um, Great organization, maybe someone's heard of it, uh, but they train rats to uh, detect mines, not just by sending a thousand rats onto the field and seeing what happens, uh, but by training them, putting them through a process where they can detect a mine, flag it, and they can go in and blow it up uh, safely. Uh, they also detect tuberculosis in uh, samples uh, at a higher rate than traditional uh, medical processes can, can do, or they, they, they increase the detection rate. Uh, this is an organization that came to Global Giving, a Founders and Ashoka Fellow, a Skull Fellow, so good background, very well, uh, well recognized. Um, as a non-US based organization, it needed a way to connect with supporters in the US, use Global Giving. Interacted extremely well, uh, received visitors, uh, was engaged on the platform, so last uh, Father's Day when Nick Kristoff called and said, hey, I want to recommend an alternative gift for fathers for Father's Day. Mostly he said, well, well why not a giant mind-sniffing African rat? Um, he thought that was a pretty good idea, suggested it, $200,000 flowed in the next week to Hero Rats, uh, which is an organization that we have hugely high confidence in, it's doing amazing, important, innovative work. So that is the marketplace actually working. But how do we increase the number of hero rats? How do we know they're a hero rat when they don't have the good fortune of being recognized by Nick Kristoff and having all that happen? Up to this point, um, we've created a very feedback-rich environment on global giving. Uh, any organization with a project posted like global giving is required to post quarterly updates. So again, we know there's someone at the other end of that transaction, the donor knows there's someone at the other end of that transaction, and it's great narrative. Uh, we also have volunteers travel the world, mystery shopping or step, stopping in and uh, checking in with our project leaders, making sure, number one, that there's a project going on, and number two, uh, coaching them and using Global Giving more effectively. Um, and that's, that's great. Uh, the incentives we have on the marketplace are lined up to encourage this rich feedback, because the more you report, the more visible you get, the more likely it is you'll attract new donors. Uh, but this is still a bit of an echo chamber. Um, of course, the reports coming back are mostly good news. Um, of course, when volunteers go out, yes, sometimes they're confronted with situations they don't feel are extremely positive that an organization is implementing something effectively, but in most cases, they're charmed because people are well-intentioned, uh, people are doing inspiring work in really rough circumstances, and they are inspired and charmed by the effort that's going into it. Um, but this is not getting at performance. This is getting at <coughs> risk mitigation 
and verification that something is happening. Uh, so to get at performance, um, we needed a different framework. How do we break out of that echo chamber? And our idea is to Yelp-like ask the people who are reportedly being served by the organizations we are helping to gain funding, what do they think? Um, an analog is, is Yelp. I don't know how many folks are familiar with Yelp. It's a data, daily tool in my, in my life. It's a website where if you're preparing for a presentation uh, in an unfamiliar city, in, in a part of a city that you've never been in, like this morning I was preparing at the Novotel, and I wanted to not have breakfast in the hotel, but do something interesting. Uh, I found the pea meal bacon uh, sandwich at the carousel over at uh, St. Lawrence Market. Because the, it was awesome, it was really good. Um, so, um, because Yelp has created this feedback rich environment and, give it, and given it to me in an actionable way, uh, this is an incredible decision making tool for me in a situation where I have to decide how am I going to spend the next hour and ten dollars um, while I prep for presentation. Um, so how do we how do we use this to gather feedback from the beneficiaries when there isn't a stable carousel bakery that people go to and evaluate? Uh, there's but there is a, an organization doing a project on the ground. So how can we, and we, we're getting stories from the projects, and we think we can probably get stories from the people they're serving, but how do we Yelp-like make sense of it and make it into an actionable tool? That's where our, uh, through contacts at Rockefeller Foundation, um, who are sorting through some of these same issues at a much larger scale, we were introduced to Dave Snowden, uh, who runs Cognitive Edge, um, and has invented the SenseMaker suite of software. Um, I lifted the, David hope it's a good quote to lift, but I lifted this quote. Uh, and so this, what it does is it provides a decision maker with the ability to see the world through the eyes of their customer, their staff, their citizens, or even their enemies. Just add beneficiaries onto the end of that, and that's what we're doing. Um, so essentially what we've done, what, what this methodology is, is you ask people, you ask them a question, and they tell you a story in return. Then you ask them to tag their story in an organized way, which then all feeds into the piece of software so you can visualize what people are saying and see groupings, see trends, and if you do it continuously, you see how things change over time. So ultimately, uh, this is a way to kind of get inside the mind of a community that is experiencing directly the interventions that we're helping fund through Global, global giving. So, who are the storytellers? These are the storytellers. These are girls in a soccer league in Katali, Kenya, um, who were part of a baraza and marched to groups of the teams into uh, uh, their office, and we asked them to tell a story, and we asked them to tag their own story. We had grand visions of doing this directly into a bank of computers set up, and uh, that wasn't realistic in a place like uh, 20 kilometers outside of Katali, or in Kibera, or in many of the other neighborhoods we're working in Kenya on this pilot. Um, but then we realized, well, it's actually relatively cheap to get data transcribed. So let's go pencil and paper. And uh, we corrected our course, and it really worked, because you can have 60 beneficiaries, like these girls, writing stories at the same time. So we were able to collect uh, 3,000 plus stories in 10 weeks using $1,500 in incentives for volunteers to go out and collect those stories. So we collected an enormous amount of feedback um, for a very small amount of money uh, by going directly to these folks and unchaining ourselves from the technology that we had hoped to use in the first place. Um, so what did we ask them to tell us? Very important thing, and Dave is instrumental in version one, is we're simplifying it in, in version two. So say, ask them something general. Can you tell us a story about one past community effort you witnessed or know about? Uh, this one happens to be, if you can't read it, bringing the tribes together after 
the post-election violence through sports. So this happens to be a story about a project run by one of our partner organizations called TISA, outside of Katali. Um, difficult to measure outputs from a, an intervention like that. Um, how much more peace is there? How much less likely is it that if the referendum didn't pass, there would have been violence because of their intervention? Um, that's a complex question. Um, but what we can say is that, number one, TISA did something that people participated in it, had good things to say about it. Um, then we asked them to fill in data about their own story, which then allows us to group and map and visualize. Uh, just one, I'm not gonna go through the whole framework, but one of the questions was who benefited from the events in the story? Is it outsiders? Is it the people leading the effort? Or is it the community themselves? From there, you look at all the stories you've collected, and you look at, wow, here's a group of stories that talk where the storyteller has said it's outsiders benefiting, or it's the leaders themselves benefiting. What's going on with those stories? Then you read them, and the brain can kind of make sense of a smaller group. Maybe all those stories are about one organization whose leader is essentially just taking all the money. You've just detected a problem. Um, if you do that continually, you can benchmark over time, and it becomes even more powerful. That's essentially what we've done. Ask people what they think. Um, Another benefit to this is we're not just asking about our own programs, we're asking people something general. So a lot of times it's very difficult to get information about what you didn't ask about. This way it's open-ended. So we're learning about other organizations and other projects that uh, are totally outside the Global Giving Network, which is informative because we can benchmark Global Giving organizations against others, uh, which is very helpful. And if there's a great organization that everyone's talking about in extremely positive ways, we need them at Global Giving. So what did we learn? Um, Kachuki runs TISA. Um, fantastic guy, extremely generous with his family's money and land and time. Uh, he runs this soccer league and essentially it's, um, if, you, if you want to be in the league, you have to stay in school. And they help the kids stay in school um, through various ways, even if they've had kids, even if they're going through all the difficult things that rural youth in Kenya go through. Uh, but if you stay in school, you have to play in the soccer league and it's, it's cool. Um, so they also have this intervention which is around child rights and child protection. And none of the stories were about that. So I think, well, that's, that's interesting. Nobody knows about this thing that we've poured all these resources into over the past six months. Let's look a little bit more closely at that. So that's just one nugget of actionable information that came from the effort of collecting stories from his beneficiaries. So in closing, what did we learn? Um, we learned that people will tell stories and that acknowledgement is the most important thing. Uh, it's what drives YouTube and people looking at the stupid things each other do. Um, people just want to see themselves online. They want to know that their opinions matter. It's what drives Yelp. It's what drives Facebook to a certain extent. Um, the SenseMaker visualizations really work. Uh, we were able to generate stories, visualize them, and you come up with actionable information. Um, stories don't just help us mitigate risk, but they help organizations learn, like Tysa. Very promising moment when they say, well, we looked at the stories and we learned something. So that we didn't have to do a long scientific study. We gathered some stories, we visualized them, they learned, and they can course correct, they can do dive more. This is a helpful decision-making tool. Um, we learned that the self-reports we've been getting are demonstrably insufficient. We, we kind of knew that they were overly positive, but we did a little side experiment where we had um, outsiders tag the, the self-reports that we've been getting. And we compared those tags against what the community members were saying about the same organizations running those projects. And you could actually see how one of the one of the triangles that the outsiders tagging the story saw that the community must be really united behind this project, whereas in reality the community was saying the attitudes towards this organization are indifferent at best. So you could see data showing that yes, this is the positive bias, which we knew it was already there, but it's very stark when you can actually visualize it. 
Um, we also did another side experiment that just showed how community members and experts just fundamentally see things differently. Um, we asked a panel of experts to go in and tag uh, some of the stories that we had gathered. And one of the parameters was, what is this, what is this story about? Um, is it about social relations? Is it about food? Is it about safety and security? Is it about government? Overwhelmingly, the beneficiaries themselves said it was about social relations. And overwhelmingly, the experts said it was about food and security. Um, again, just a uh, very stark uh, revelation that, of something you already knew, but it's shocking when you kind of see it, that uh, community members and experts see things in fundamentally kind of different ways. So our next steps are to actually embed this process more fundamentally into the global giving feedback environment so that we can make sense of all the narrative we're getting in a more continuous basis. Um, we are um, expanding the pilot with help from Rockefeller Foundation um, in Kenya and also to uh, Uganda and Tanzania. And by the end of the year, it'll be a ubiquitous part of the global giving website so it can spontaneously happen anywhere else in the world. Uh, we're seeking peer review of the methodology uh, to get more feedback on our feedback uh, mechanism. Um, and then ultimately, uh, we have to figure out how to bring this back to the communities. Yes, all of the stories are now available on the Global Giving website. We've used Yushahidi to kind of map them. But we're also looking at sharing them uh, with uh, Development Gateway, uh, which is funded by the World Bank and interested in mapping out um, all official and uh, sort of philanthropic development initiatives, contributing into that, contributing these stories wherever we can so that it becomes part of the larger kind of development feedback ecosystem. Um, that's about it. Thanks. Um, because we're running a little short on time, I'm going to try an experiment. Um, there's, uh, there's a couple of people in the audience that have also tremendous amounts of experience in this. And so I, I, if you don't mind, I think it would be especially pertinent to, to get your questions out and, and to challenge our panelists. Um, because they've had the luxury of just uh, of not being challenged for the last half hour. Uh, so I don't know if, if like Mike or, or Owen or, uh, or obviously uh, David or Real. Um, or uh, Christy or Christine. Uh, um, I mean, you and, and, and others I know have, or Boris, <laughs> uh, have a lot of experience in doing this, and I would like to sort of uh, get your challenging questions for, for our panels. Any, any takers? Uh, yeah, Megan, perfect. Uh, so, I'm, I'm Megan, I'm the uh, co director of our water team in Malawi. Um, and my question's for, for John. Uh, so, first of all, I would Congratulations on, on, on really taking on like that uh, an attempt of, of ways to get feedback. It's really exciting to see. Uh, something that, that Gary mentioned was uh, in what raised was that he would see projects that were successful as they were ongoing, um, and then and then really not lead to success once once support was withdrawn. And it seems from what you put up there that, and I would expect from what I know of communities that the things that they would raise in narrative, and especially the things that they would value about projects would be things that indicate um, indicate a, a service or a product, or a product delivery, and not necessarily um, would things that would lead to sustainability or, or, or yeah, lead to sustainability, <coughs> sustainability be, be valued by communities and therefore not reported. So is that something that you're able to mitigate in that, in that or are you only able, is this a uh, way of of making sense out of narratives only good for uh, kind of immediate, the current current uh, uh, success, not not indicators of future success. Uh, I'll just I'll take two more if, that, if that's okay. Any other two other questions? Yeah, Florian. Yeah. Can you speak louder? Please? Speak louder, please. Mm -hmm. Why?
just an alternative and we'll jump this across it. Okay, uh, so first question is, um, in the case of failures, um, who, uh, sort of, how do you manage that? Because it obviously it has impacts on, on partners and on, uh, on beneficiaries, and so how, how, how is that sort of managed? And then the second question is, who benefits from, uh, from the information that's collected the most, and does that sort of uh, incentive and sort of that benefit alignment uh, matter in the, t in the quality of the information that you get, you get access to? Um, and then a final question, sure, Owen. Uh, sure, my name's Owen Scott with the Malawi Water Supply Team. Just um, after Eric Beinhofer's presentation this morning, there was a Q&A with him, and one of the things we were discussing was one of the challenges in the NGO community is, unlike in evolutionary systems, bad solutions don't, ne don't get crowded out automatically. And so specifically with the example of, uh, of SenseMaker, but also for any of the other panelists, I was wondering if you have any examples of better feedback and mechanisms than crowding out or pushing out bad solutions to allow better solutions to take their place. Perfect. Um, and then I'll, I'll challenge Vernon. Um, uh, my question is, is uh, one, of the, one of the big tensions in, in development is, is managing relationships, and particularly managing relationships across distances, typically. And so how, uh, and it's obviously something that is you know, a big challenge of, within the VC entrepreneurship sort of. And so um, how do you manage sort of being uh, the support while being the person who can take hard decisions? How do you manage uh, sort of not taking too much time yet making sure you have the right information to make decisions? And then if you can try and, I think usually VCs fund within the 50 kilometer radius and for good reasons, but if you had to do that across 6,000 kilometers, how would that sort of change? Okay. Hello. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll talk, speak to Megan's question first about the community's sort of ability to uh, critique or comment on the sort of immediate success versus sort of something that might be ongoing and sustainable. I, I think the jury's out. I think the potential is what we've done in Kenya from the first stage is really a snapshot, um, which is good because we did it, uh, but it's insufficient in terms of how, how does this really play out over time. Um, so I think, what the, in my mind, the way uh, we can address that, and I'll pick Dave's brain later on on it too, is uh, uh, when we go to continuous sort of capture, um, how do we look at uh, community attitudes towards things over time? Because it's over time that you know, these, these failures sort of become, become evident. Uh, but yeah, that, it, we realize that you can't just do a snapshot every of one place and then move on to another place and do a snapshot. That's not sufficient. It's got to be continuous. Let me take the the question of um, what do you do with the failures? Uh, uh, I, I I guess you have to learn from them, and and somebody needs to take on the responsibility for um, doing something differently uh, as a result of those of those failures and to some degree I think that is the um, in our case I think it's the Rockefeller Foundation that has a, a responsibility to uh, to learn from those failures so um, you know many times you do have implementing agencies and organizations that that really aren't equipped to go through that whole 20-year agricultural development uh, process that I had on that on that one slide uh, and you have to make as a, as a donor you have to make transitions from an initial group uh, that say gets the people fed um, who are totally undernourished and starving to the next group that knows something about how you commercialize agriculture uh, and can move to that that other phase. And in, in the case of the example I gave with the uh, with with the trying to improve soil fertility without utilizing fertilizer, um, a number of the organizations that were that we were funding were philosophically opposed to fertilizer. 
they were groups that were promoting um, various forms of organic agriculture in, in Africa. And as I mentioned, some of them were successful when they could tap into that premium market, and we're all for that. Uh, but uh, we came to the conclusion that integrated soil fertility management, uh, where you use fertilizer very judiciously, uh, as well as using a variety of organic methods, uh, and they become quite synergistic, uh, that that was a better strategy. So we funded research in that area. But even if you're going to use fertilizer judiciously, the farmers need access to that fertilizer. So we're also uh, investing in the in the uh, fertilizer value chain and trying to, uh, to bring the, uh, the price of, uh, of fertilizer down. So, um, you know, that, that in initial set of grantees really didn't want to, first of all, admit failure, <laughs> uh, because in, in many of, of their minds, the project uh, was successful, and to some degree, the projects were successful. It just didn't go to scale. Uh, even the ones that were able to sell to that premium organic market uh, benefited uh, a small number of farmers. Uh, and if it did go to scale, uh, you would very quickly saturate that, uh, that market. So I think there's a, there's a responsibility for, um, for those groups like the Foundation or the World Bank or, uh, or governments uh, to facilitate that that transition, but to learn uh, from those failures. I wish we had the, uh, the narrative <coughs> approach uh, uh, back when we were trying to figure out why those women farmers weren't adopting these, quote, successful uh, technologies. We probably would have gotten some very interesting stories. And then, yeah, just to go along, I can tie both failure questions together, perhaps. So, totally violent agreement uh, that point of failure is learning. Uh, when we detect a failure, it's not necessarily an automatically punitive uh, repercussions. The failure generates learning and generates improvement. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a good thing. Um, and then Owen's question, uh, we have one bright shining moment of beneficiary feedback uh, crowding out failure and allowing something uh, new to emerge actually submitted that to the, the failure site that's launching this afternoon. So that's a, uh, it's, it's a, it's a great example. Again, in Kenya, the community feedback was um, overwhelmingly concerned and negative about our organization, but they wanted it to continue getting funded because it was the only game in town. Um, ultimately, through an iterative process, another organization came in and uh, Battle Counts is doing much better and the old organization's leader has skipped town. So, um, so it, it's, a, it's a real example of, of that actually working. I wish we had 100 examples of that uh, working, but we've got a, one really good one, so that's, uh, that's a start. Um, and then on the, on the, ben the benefits of the, the feedback, ideally it benefits everybody in the process. So the, the beneficiaries hopefully end up getting served better um, by organizations that are learning how to serve them better. Um, the funders or operators of a marketplace like Global Giving can tune and tweak strategy about where, what, to, what to do and, and, and where, and that uh, ultimately, um, if all of that can be contributed to the field, uh, the general ecosystem of, of development, we hope that all, all of that feedback can inform everybody else's decision making as well. That's the, uh, that's the idea. Right, right now, on our, our first, first iteration, it, it's, it's useful in Kenya as a proof of concept that we can then take um, next slide. Try to remember all of Louis' questions. Um, I think one of them was around what happens when you know, things aren't going well and you, you have to be supportive yet also, uh, I guess, have the discipline. Um, and it sort of strikes a little bit to, I think it was Owen's question about uh, bad ideas. But one of the, one of the tough parts about um, investing in a venture community is that you have to be very supportive and try to help somebody build a business. But you know, part of the reason for the staged capital, and that might relate to Owen's question a little bit, is when you when a business is a bad idea for whatever reason that you may not have anticipated up front, you have to have the discipline to be able to stop funding it and uh, you know move on. And it is a tough role to play um, when you find yourself in that position. However, what we try to do to manage that is to get very very clear up front when everybody's happy and everybody's in the same um, 
you know, in the same boat, that if things aren't being met, there's going to be some tough decisions that have to be made. Sometimes, you know, funding can continue, but sometimes it can't. Uh, and that is something that is a very difficult thing to do, and it's a discipline that's required that may be relevant to what you guys do. In terms of the distance, um, you know, you're right. Most VCs will not invest in something beyond, you know, our, our rule of thumb is kind of a one-hour plane ride. And, and the reason is, you know, and I think John speaks to this in the, in the example of how the leaders had one view, yet the people in the communities had a different view. Well, the way VCs get that sense is we walk around the office, and, you know, the CEO may be telling you one thing, but talk to the staff and look at people's eyes and see what the dynamic is, see what the vibe in the office is, or go talk to customers. And you get a, perhaps a very different sense of what's going on. And the only way you can do that is by being on the ground. Now, if you have to be 6,000 miles away or whatever distance away, and we've invested in companies in California, we want a proxy. We want somebody who's with us on our side of the table. So we've invested, for example, with other VCs who are in California, in a California company. So we talk to them. We get They're the ones walking around and getting a read and giving us the sort of the non-financial or non uh, uh, you know, objective uh, stuff, and then we'll be out there as frequently as we can. Well, when when it's a local company, it depends on the business. If we think things are going well, we don't really need to do that that often. If we are concerned that there's problems or we're heading in the wrong direction, we'll be you know we spend once a week if need be with uh, with an objective of getting it back on track. Like our orientation is, let's help, uh, let's find out what's going on, and we'll, we'll help. But if if we think there's a big problem. Uh, I think I think clearly uh, we're uh, we're being asked to move on because uh, we have a tight schedule. I'm I'm assuming everyone sees this as a conversation starter, and, and I know that our, our our panelists will be will be sticking around for at least a little bit longer today, if not uh, throughout the weekend. So I encourage you to approach them, and uh, thank you very much for coming. And please, thank you.